Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. We are proud and honored today to be launching a new and very important report by the Sentry, a program of the Enough Project. The report's title is Covert Capital, the Kabila Family's Secret Investment Bank. It is a complex report that was exquisitely and painstakingly researched by John DeLasso, who is here with us today to present his findings. Um, John is one of those individuals, um, up until this moment, who has quietly labored behind the scenes in secrecy and relative safety. And so he is coming forward today. Um, I hope that everyone will give him a, a very warm welcome um, because what he's done is very brave um, and we're very proud, as I said, to have him um, and very proud of our collaboration with the Enough Project. It's also my very great pleasure to announce the addition of our newest senior fellow, Ambassador Rama Yad, who has very kindly agreed to moderate this discussion. Um, Rama has already had a very distinguished career. Um, in addition to being France's ambassador to UNESCO, she was also Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and Human Rights and was the first um, French woman of African descent to serve um, in a ministerial capacity in France. So again, we are very honored to have her as well. This should be an extremely exciting event. Um, I'm delighted that you are all here. And with that, I'm going to turn over to John to present a summary of the report, after which we'll have a panel, which Rama will introduce, and questions from you. Thank you, John. Hello, and Bronwyn, thank you very much for your kind introductory remarks. And I would like to thank the Atlantic Council's Africa Center for hosting this event and the conversation. Uh, also, it's a, a real honor and privilege to have uh, Ambassador Rama Yad um, moderating this event. Uh, if you're not aware of her background, I suggest you read her biography. It's truly inspiring. Um, I'd also like to thank the other distinguished panelists, uh, renowned Congo analyst Mvemba Dizolele of IRI, and also illicit finance expert uh, Lakshmi Kumar of Global Financial Integrity. Uh, my name is John DeLoso, uh, as Brahman said. I'm a senior investigator at The Century. Uh, if you're not familiar with my organization, we were founded about three years ago. Uh, and our purpose is to follow the money, um, to create consequences for kleptocrats and the international networks that enable them. Um, we focus on DRC, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Sudan. However, as many people in this room will understand, Corruption very rarely respects national boundaries. So while those are the four countries we follow, oftentimes our investigations crisscross multiple jurisdictions. And I think this report is a very good example of that. So I'll start by giving a little bit of background on why we undertook this work. We came upon a, a little known investment firm by the name of Kwanzaa Capital that was based in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, we had seen it referenced in media reports and some NGO reports as well. Uh, the firm got our attention, but we didn't really have a clear sense of the scope of its operations, activities, and affiliates. Uh, however, that scope became fairly clear after we systematically evaluated the firm and started to peel back the layers. And with every layer that we peeled back, we noticed additional uh, Congolese elites, uh, people elsewhere on the continent who are quite important and notable, as well as people of importance both in business and politics from three other continents. Uh, so that certainly got our attention. So what did we find? We determined uh, first and foremost that Kwanzaa Capital, this investment firm, was controlled by the Kabila family uh, and its inner circle. And its intent was to be used as a vehicle to purchase financial institutions, in this case, commercial banks. The family ties were apparently kept hidden because the financial world, in the financial world, those kinds of connections to elites, as many of you in this room will understand, uh, create compliance risks, to put it mildly. The firm was run by President Kabila's brother, Francis Soleimani Ntwale, otherwise known as Soleimani, who was the managing director until 2018 of a commercial bank by the name of BGFI Bank DRC, which is a bank whose past conduct the century a number of NGOs and other media organizations have written uh, quite a few articles about. Um, Soleimani wasn't listed on the formal articles of incorporation for this company, again, for good reason. Um, he was running BGFI Bank DRC 
at the same time that he was running Kwanzaa Capital, which is an investment bank that had all of its accounts at BGFI Bank DRC. So I'm sure those of you who deal in compliance issues will understand a major red flag there alone. So the Century reviewed Kwanzaa Capital's financial records. We found indicators of money laundering. We found indicators of millions of dollars in misappropriation, misappropriated public funds. And also we found that these final financial records showed that these accounts served as something of a cash machine for the Kabila family and its inner circle. So overall, the Century's investigation suggests that it was a major priority for the Kabila family to exercise control over the domestic banking and finance sector in Congo. And in fact, and this is a fairly staggering statistic, we found that of the banks that Kwanzaa Capital and its affiliates targeted, that accounted for 28% of the $5 billion banking sector in Congo. Um, while those attempts didn't succeed for a range of reasons, primarily having to do with compliance, uh, the efforts are notable for a number of reasons. So most importantly, Kwanzaa Capital did not act alone. And this is not a purely Congolese story. These acquisition efforts involved a host of foreign actors, including a notorious Swiss Angolan financier who is a business partner of former Angolan president uh, Dos Santos's son, a lawyer who served on the board of US-based law firm Oric at the time of his dealings with Kwanzaa Capital, and a Chinese magnate who runs a multi-billion dollar conglomerate in China with affiliates uh, elsewhere in the world. So you might be asking yourself, what are the consequences of these findings that I've just laid out for you? So first and foremost, if a firm such as Kwanzaa Capital with very deep ties to political elites in a country where there is rampant corruption had been able to gain control over a commercial bank, uh, that would have provided a ready means of laundering the proceeds of rampant corruption. But again, the consequences are not just related to Congo. When the kinds of people we call politically exposed persons, which includes individuals with a prominent public function, their associates, and their family members, control financial institutions, it can undermine the international controls in place to prevent things like money laundering and the financing of terrorism. So the consequences extend beyond Joseph Kabila and the exploitative system of governance that he and his inner circle have entrenched and profited from quite handsomely. But another consequence is that creating an environment where financial institutions see Congo as too risky ends up hurting everyday citizens. So fewer of them will have access to banking services and fewer will benefit from responsible outside investment in a country that so desperately needs it. So this kind of corruption has a real world impact. And I'll close out by offering a brief summary of the recommendations we are making in order to prevent future abuses of this sort. But first I wanna clarify, the Century's goal here is not to create barriers to investment in Congo. We're not trying to frighten financial institutions from establishing relationships or maintaining relationships with financial institutions in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Rather, we are highlighting negative past conduct in the hopes that the powers in place will take positive action to prevent that kind of activity from taking place. And we also seek to offer constructive solutions that will help them do just that. So with that, uh, here are some of the general recommendations that we have offered in our report. First, foreign regulators and law enforcement authorities should investigate the activities laid out in this report for potential criminal wrongdoing or sanctionable offenses in line with their current sanctions authorities. Second, foreign financial institutions should do a retrospective assessment of what kind of exposure they had or have to the individuals entities, transactions, and activities laid out in this report, and they should take appropriate action to include filing suspicious transaction reports with the appropriate national uh, regulator. Finally, we would recommend that financial institutions use this report, although it is most specifically about Congo, as a means of educating their compliance staff on uh, various typologies of corruption, money laundering, etc. Finally, with the Congolese government, we recommend they look into the allegations of stolen money from government coffers and take appropriate action. Next, we also suggest that the Congolese government take any appropriate action to ensure that the primary regulatory agency for the banking sector, which is the Central Bank of Congo, uh, that it operate within its legal mandate and that it not operate in the interests of private individuals and their commercial uh, interests. Finally, 
we urge the Congolese government to put political will and resources behind the country's financial intelligence unit. That is the agency that should be examining potentially suspicious transactions. That is called the CENEREF. That's an important player in this calculation. They will help pre prevent abuses in the banking system if they have political will and if they have the resources to do so. Without their empowerment, the government would be, in a certain sense, leaving the potential architects of corruption to police themselves. With that, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak, and I look forward to this spirited discussion. Thank you, Bronwyn, for uh, this uh, introduction. Thank you uh, all for, uh, for coming so many to attend this uh, important event for Atlantic Council. Um, let me start by introducing our panelists to you. Except John, of course, uh, Bronwyn talked about him. You know him now after the presentation of, uh, of his uh, report. A few, a few, a few words, uh, though. Um, it is an important report. Um, I think, uh, in a historical moment, for the GRC, for Africa, and for the world. Um, I'm not surprised by the high quality of uh, of this tough work. As a lanceur d'alerte, the Sentry seeks to expose those who profit from war in Africa, as you see, in failed state, hijacked state, not only in the DRC, but in Sudan also. That is interesting what is happening now in Sudan also. Um, corruption, I'd like uh, us to understand that corruption is not uh, occasional. It is a system um, of governance. So that's why it is so tough and so interesting to work on it. Um, we have two other panelists here. I, I'm sure that uh, some of you know, know them. Mr. Bemba Dizolele, uh, you have a wonderful career. It's not a career, it's a commitment, I should say. Uh, first of all, you are a senior advisor uh, at the International Republican Institute, a lecturer in uh, African studies at the John Hopkins University, um, and a senior associate in the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Beyond these positions, very interesting positions, you have testified on African affairs before the United Nations Security Council and uh, the US Congress also. Especially, you won a grant from the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting to cover the 2006 elections in the DRC where you were embedded with uh, UN peacekeepers. You are also the author of uh, a widely acclaimed documentary report on the role of Coltan, of Coltan in the DRC. Thank you for your amazing work on Congolese matters. We are honored to have you here. Unquestionably, your work has helped to, to alert the world to the seriousness of the situation in the DRC. Last but not least, Mrs. Uh, Lakshmi Kumar, thank you for being here too. As policy director at Global Financial Integrity, a DC-based uh, think tank, you are focused on promoting pragmatic transparency measures in the international financial system to combat corruption and illicit financial flows. Prior to joining um, GFI, you were a lawyer in India. You have worked with governments and uh, regulatory agencies across South Asia, East Africa, and Eurasia to investigate money laundering and uh, terrorist financing risks to, to, the system, to the financial systems. Your high level of uh, expertise is a chance for our discussion, of course. No doubt that uh, you will enlighten the debate thanks to your brilliant and, uh, and deep knowledge of illicit finance. Thank you so much. Um, 
Before we start, I'd like to take the opportunity of this special event to, uh, to tell how happy and excited I am to be uh, appointed here as a senior fellow um, after joining Atlantic Council, especially Africa Center, and its amazing team under the direction of uh, VP uh, Peter Pham. He's not here today because he's traveling, but uh, he knows how grateful I am. Um, and I'd like to thank him for his trust and uh, his warm welcome. So that's why that after a decade of political commitment in France, <laughs> yes, I started very young. Uh, unfortunately, you will have guessed that I am uh, the least expert in this panel. But as former minister for foreign affairs and human rights, um, I visited many times the DRC and especially the Kivus in Eastern Congo, where I had the honor to work with Dr. Mukbege, uh, recently honored by the Nobel Prize. Today, I have the privilege to moderate a very important conversation in a crucial context in Africa and particularly in DRC, as I said. So let's move to the debate. We will have uh, 30 minutes um, between us um, before before uh, moving to the audience for 20 or 30 minutes. We'll have uh, to close the discussion at 5 p.m. So this report is alarming. That's the, for the first word I, I think. Oh, Incompromising, promising. Um, I would like uh, to ask now our two other panelists what they think about it, if they share this opinion. Uh, if they have learned something new uh, in the report. Um, you have, sorry, but you have three to five minutes to give your answer. Um, so please respect the time. Uh, maybe we could uh, begin with you, Lakshmi, and then Beba. Um, so reading the report, no, because keeping in mind that we have three to five minutes, the, the broad themes that uh, I think struck out to me is the issue one of politically exposed persons and what it means in a country. Now, politically exposed persons by itself, you know, financial action task force recommendations are high risk entities. Now, the risk get to that gets compounded depending on how entrenched the politically exposed person's influence is within a government. So if you are in a government structure, you control the judiciary, the police, financial institutions, then the level of risk to that economy and the risks that emanate from that politically per exposed person are heightened. Now, co conversely, let's say you're PEP in another country, but you don't have control over the military, judiciary, then your influence, your ability to capture the state, capture financial institutions, uh, you know, drastically reduced. And, and, and this report sort of is an excellent example that goes back to previous examples with Estrada in Philippines, um, Pinochet in Chile, where you have people in positions of government that not only have influence within the governmental institution, but overarching influence across a variety of actors. I think the second big question that comes to mind here is the role that a central bank is supposed to play. Very often you see in Western, Western or advanced economies, a central bank is surely a body that exists to monitor price stability, inflation, and monetary policy. In emerging markets in both lower income countries and middle income countries, the role of the central bank is also a role that's imbued with the developmental authority. So a central bank takes on the role of commercial banking, prioritizing lending, focusing on particular sectors, financial inclusion. And you know, when these lines set, start to get blurred, there is sometimes scope for preferential treatment if the mandate of the central bank and the transparency and governance structures around it don't adequately account for risks. Uh, then I think the next point that we come to is gatekeepers and service providers. When, when you are conducting financial transactions, any money laundering scheme does not exist in isolation. For a truly sophisticated money laundering scheme to exist, for it to cross borders, you need lawyers, accountants, company formation agents, banks to play a role. Because that gives you access not just to the domestic or regional financial system, but access to an international financial system where when, where when money finds a home, it is a lot harder to claw back. 
and, and that's something we see here. Finally, um, John very, I think it's something that often gets overlooked is the cascading effect of this. Very often when we hear of corruption or we talk about money laundering with either a bank or in a country with a political party, we look at it through the microscope of saying, oh, let's impose sanctions on this individual, let's curtail the finances of this financial institution. But the real issue is that once we start doing that, and this is a, has been a global phenomenon going back, that I think that financial institutions all over the world are monitoring is the consequences of de-risking that are tied not just to sanction regimes, but they're also tied to profitability and risk profile. And what it has meant is that you can see clear losses, not just in terms of financial inclusion, but also in abilities of individuals and businesses within countries to access trade finance, um, uh, money services, businesses, to, to, to be able to successfully participate in, in an economic environment. To just give you one example that is not from the Congo, in Somalia when de-risking happened because they were considered so high risk, 25 to 40% of the country's GDP was based on remittances that in one fell swoop was lost to the country. So we're talking not just about incidental effects, we're talking about long-term lasting effects that prevent growth of business. And you know, some of the other things that I hope to touch upon while we have a conversation about this is you know, the, the need for adequate and robust, robust due diligence, how our financial systems don't exist in isolation. We're, a we're, we're sort of an international financial system. And finally, this is sort of tangential to the report, but John talks about, he mentions the role of sovereign wealth funds and there is sort of, there's a longer, bigger discussion to be had on that, but um, I will limit my remarks to that for the moment. Perfect, Lakshmi. Right. It's, uh, the floor is yours, Memba. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to the uh, Atlantic Council uh, for hosting this, and, uh, and uh, thank you to Rama for moderating, and John, congratulations for the report. I think in the case of the DRC, it's very important for us to understand the context of the DRC. Many of you in the audience, of course, follow the DRC, but I think within the specific case, we need to go back to where we got here, how we got here. Um, you know, by the time the war started in the Kivus, 1995, 96, uh, the banking sector in DRC was down. We had had Piaget in 92, so the last years of Mobutu, the banking industry was kaput, so to speak. So as the rebellion started advancing, we know that Laurent Désiré Kabila was already entering into deals with various entities as he was in the Maquis, in the bush, if you will. Um, as he came to Kinshasa by that time, the, the banks that start emerging, emerge within this shadow of deals that were brokered with different actors. Some of them are mentioned in the report. And we went from there. Um, so quickly, within the Parliament of Transition, there were reports that were coming very quickly. So we had the Bakandeja report, uh, we had Utundula report with the mining industry, because this is not just a banking thing. This is a wider and broader um, uh, uh, challenge that the DRC is facing. But what we saw is that the only bank, private bank that was working at the time was Citibank, which also lost a lot of its cadre. People like Jean-Claude Massangu, Michel Osembe, all of them eventually left that sector. So it was depleted. So anybody who wanted to take the risk and collaborate with the new regime was up for it, and they got what they wanted. So this created, so when the report came, the Lutundula Bakandeja report, they got a lot of support in the DRC, but they didn't get support from the international community. This is where what Lakshmi and John are talking. These things don't happen in the vacuum. And so in case of, uh, because of those deals that were being investigated, only one armed group really collaborated, and it was Musa, uh, Musa Namwisi, with his uh, RCD KLM, they came forward. No other militia collaborated, no foreign entity collaborated. Embassies were not supporting those reports. So we can tune you from that system. And what that means is the international community compounds these mistakes. And the way we do it, one, we tend to support the, whichever person the international community chooses to become the guarantor of peace and stability is the one we support. So any investigation that is perceived from Washington, from Paris and elsewhere, that threatens that hold to that new person, 
is not supported. And when we don't support that, that means, so in the case of Kabila in, 19, in 2001, anybody who challenge who shed light on the corruption was considered a bad actor. He was a spoiler, he was not playing right. So we didn't give them the credibility or the support they needed. Uh, today we think something similar, right? So today, um, we, everybody want to align with Felix Chisekedi. Uh, the State Department will say everything was good, it's the best time, we're switching the page, it's now democratic and it's a republic. Uh, there's a spectrum there. Some people say no, no, need to be fixed. So the best way we can help DRC, President uh, Felix Chisekedi said he's gonna corrupt corruption, he made that statement here, and uh, I have one minute. So he, in the best way to help him is not to shield him from this investigation within the system. The best way to help him is to support the group, civil society, and regulators who want to shed light on this. Why? Because that will make him stronger. It will help to flush out bad actors. But also, too, it will reinforce the Congo culture. Congolese culture is a, Congo, is a culture of oversight. There are very few countries in Africa that will compete with Congo when it comes to oversight. There was oversight under Mobutu. There was oversight under Kabila Pair. The oversight and the Kabila Fis, if today the, the international community will take it seriously to impose pressure on international actors, we'll see change taking places more rapidly. So for instance, the fact that then Getle was sanctioned within the Congolese psyche, that's the biggest thing that could have happened in the last two years. Yeah. In the Congolese psyche, a powerful Jewish person can never be sanctioned by the US. The fact that a tycoon, an Israeli tycoon was sanctioned, sent a message to all of the collaborators and people that John mentioned in his report. The result was we had an election that would not have happened otherwise. The result is we have a new president, whatever you think of him. But that's those kind of action, those are the results that we have. I'll leave it there, we can take the rest in Q&A. Thank you. Remember you did right um, by recalling the context in which we are. Um, I'd like to to recall the, the human context. Uh, the DRC have been living in a context of war since 30 years, 30 years. Uh, the, the years have a, the, the wars have, an, have a name. The first Congo war, the second uh, Congo war, the third Congo war, that means something for, for the population. Five million people dead. Um, we have millions of people who are displaced, who are not at home. Um, child soldiers, children who are homeless. Um, that is a, a terrific uh, situation. And on that situation, you have a situation of corruption. That's why um, it is important to restore um, Congolese dignity um, by uh, uh, supporting such a report. And um, we hope, uh, that's why we hope that uh, the new government will, will do what, we, what, what it has to do um, to repair the, this situation. Um, now we are going to have a discussion between us before uh, your questions. So um, we are going back to, to John. Um, John, your master word is uh, war crime should not pay. So uh, follow the money. You follow the money. And uh, you published his, his report. We understand that uh, it is clearly involved a great deal of difficult research, um, performs whistleblowing on a number of influential and dangerous people. Before we tackle the substance of the report, maybe you could tell us about the process uh, you use to, for this work, uh, the risk involved in this type of research, uh, you, you won't tell us with who you worked to, to do this uh, tough job, but uh, maybe you could talk about the risk you take uh, as lanceur d'alerte. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll start by addressing the, the question of, of whistleblowers. Um, I want to say that uh, whistleblowers obviously play a very important role in these kinds of disclosures. Um, people take grave risks to themselves, to their families, to their careers to bring this kind of information forward. And I think it's a, a real shame that uh, these people are often punished 
which is why I'm glad there are organizations out there like the uh, Platform for the Protection of uh, African Whistleblowers, PLOF, and others who are, who are doing the good work to protect these people when they come forward and uh, bravely put themselves at risk to expose corruption. Um, in this report, uh, I'll also say, pardon me, that um, the Century does obviously take on some risk in doing a report like this, but it's really the whistleblowers who deserve our admiration, um, even though we cannot show that to them um, because they remain in the shadows. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out about this report in terms of how we did it is uh, you'll notice that not all of the information in the report comes from uh, what you might call hard to access places. In some cases, all we did was simply go on, on the internet and find a press release that was put out by a company that described some sort of activity that was concerning. So in particular, in the case of one of the banks we discuss in the report, uh, where a Chinese company was ultimately selected by the Central Bank of Congo to acquire it after the Central Bank of Congo had taken it under receivership, um, we found press releases in which the, uh, we found that the, the, a delegation representing this company had met with President Kabila one day in 2016, and then the next day with the Central Bank of Congo leadership. Uh, in that first meeting, we found, again, a publicly available press release. Um, they probably are now regretting that they put it out, but in that uh, press release, it notes that the uh, President Kabila had described his, quote, urgent needs to this Chinese delegation. We're not sure exactly what that means, but I think we can probably make some inferences. And then uh, in response, th this Chinese magnate said, um, thank you, Mr. Kabila, I understand your urgent needs, and I will speak with Kwanzaa Capital, which is the subject of this investigation, about the details. Uh, so that, that demonstrates a, a level of um, openness that thankfully supported our work. Um, the next day during the meeting with the Central Bank of Congo, uh, we had the, the luxury of finding a photograph that was included in one of these press releases. And in that press release, you see the Central Bank governor, you see three directors of the Central Bank, and then you see uh, a Chinese delegation, and you see um, two individuals who we identify in the report as being the, the people who are controlling Kwanzaa Capital. The most notable one is brother of Joseph Kabila, Francis Soleimani Ntwale. Uh, it's notable that that meeting happened several months before the Central Bank of Congo took this bank, BIAC, as it's called, B-I-A-C, under its control. And it just so happens that the Chinese delegation that was visiting with the Central Bank several months before, shortly thereafter incorporated a new bank, which was out of the ether selected to buy the remainder of BIAC's business. So while, yes, uh, we did benefit greatly from brave uh, whistleblowers, mm. in this case, we also found things that were in the open uh, that were very, very useful in presenting this case. Thank you for, for this who helped you to, to have this, uh, this, uh, these uh, results uh, through this report. Um, I'd like to um, now focus on, on a strange story you tell page 10, 11, and 12, about uh, a chapter buying a banks. Um, it's about Angola, uh, a strange story about Angola. Um, and uh, I will say the Angola Sovereign Wealth Fund, Switzerland-based Cantum Global. This Cantum Global offered 70 to $80 million to finance um, Kwanzaa Capital's effort, efforts to acquire a commercial bank, a famous commercial bank in, uh, in Congo, in, in, DR, in the DRC. Um, there is something strange about the Angolan connection in this case, um, in part because we have new heads of state in both countries, Angola and the DRC, who are, it would seem, operating within the constraints of the highly corrupt systems they inherited from their predecessors. <coughs> so what does the fact that a business partner of the Dos Santos family was offering a loan to a Kabila-linked business say about that relationship? Particularly, since it seems the funds for that loan might have come from Angolan government's coffers. Um, that is a, 
That is not a national uh, system. That is an international system. Tell us something about, about that. Absolutely. Please. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think maybe what I could do is, is summarize a little bit uh, this specific instance that Ambassador Yade is discussing. And then I would like to uh, turn it over to uh, Lakshmi and Mbemba, perhaps to talk about general risk related to sovereign wealth funds and also uh, really what this means with respect to DRC Angola relations. Uh, so for those of you who have not had the, the luxury of, of reading through this fairly dense report, uh, essentially what we're describing is um, a circumstance where Kwanzaa Capital uh, attempted to buy 67% stake in a, the second largest commercial bank in Congo which at that time was owned by a uh, Belgian and Congolese family, uh, the Forests. George Forrest, yeah. Yes, exactly. He's still there. Uh, he is still the yeah. owner, correct. Um, so the interesting thing is that uh, Kwanzaa Capital is incorporated in June 2014. And then in 2015, what we find is that uh, the Congolese government, which is a roughly 26% shareholder in this commercial bank, um, and it says it very clearly in, in this commercial bank's annual report, uh, the Congolese government requested that a man by the name of Pascal Kinduelo be named the chairman of the board of directors of this commercial bank. It just so happens that simultaneously, Pascal Kinduelo was the CEO of Kwanzaa Capital, the topic of this report, and that he was also serving as the chairman of the board of directors of a separate commercial bank, which I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, BGFI Bank DRC. I will note that Mr. Kinduelo no longer holds a position at BGFI Bank DRC or its parent company in Libreville, Gabon, but he is still the chairman of the board of directors of uh, this, this particular commercial bank, Banque Commerciale du Congo. Uh, so we have this situation where people affiliated with the Kabilas and Kwanzaa Capital are named to the board of this commercial bank at the same time that Kwanzaa Capital is itself trying to acquire a majority stake in that bank, which presents, um, to put it rather subtly, uh, compliance problems. And uh, at this time, it would appear that Kwanzaa Capital sought external financing. And the partner they sought for external financing was none other than uh, Switzerland headquartered Quantum Global, which some of you may know, up until recently, was the asset manager for the $5 billion Angolan Sovereign Wealth Fund. So Mr. Bastos, Jean-Claude Bastos, who is the head of Quantum Global still, but is no longer serving as the asset manager for the Sovereign Wealth Fund, also is a business partner of President Dos Santos' son, Jose, Jose Filomeno Dos Santos. So what we see here is kleptocracies converging in a, a frankly staggering way, and yet uh, this deal proceeded until the point where it couldn't, and that was roughly two and a half years after uh, all of these actions started getting underway. So um, it is a very fascinating case. This is a bank that is listed on a European stock market. Um, and uh, that's essentially the, the, the summary of that case. But I certainly recommend you read the full section on Banque Commerciale du Congo because it's quite complex and, and very compelling, I would say. But with that, I think um, I would leave it to Mbemba and Lakshmi perhaps to discuss, again, sovereign wealth funds, uh, and also Angola DRC relations. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. So I think to understand sort of how sovereign wealth funds play into this report, it's important to know the history of sovereign wealth funds, which is sovereign wealth funds were set up in commodity rich countries. So there are about 39 to 40 sovereign wealth funds, and most of them don't exist in the West. They exist in Asia and Africa, where for commodity rich countries, it was a way to sort of safeguard resources for a time if when commodity prices went down or you ran out of commodities. Essentially, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund came when Norway discovered oil and you know now it's one of the largest in the world, valued at a trillion dollars. Similarly, you have sovereign wealth funds, again, in Ang Angola, which is a commodity-rich country. You have it in Qatar, you have it in Saudi Arabia. And the purpose of sovereign wealth funds very often is threefold. One, it is stability, to make sure if the commodity prices were to slump, that means there is enough of a reserve of cash to contribute to the economy. A very good example is Chile. Chile did this when copper prices slumped, they had enough of a reserve. The second goal is maximization, which is to sort of find ways to increase revenue, not just create a stable system, but increase revenue. And the third thing is to find 
opportunities for economic development. So you will see like the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund invests quite heavily in the US in the tech sector. So Uber and a lot of tech companies all over California are funded by the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund along with the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. Now what is important in all of this is, is, is uh, which underscores is that sovereign wealth funds exist to safeguard the interests of the country. Now the problem with some of this is that sovereign wealth funds, there is no clear understanding of what the structure of a sovereign wealth fund is, who, the, who are the beneficial owners, because a lot of it is in countries where if you measure democracy on a spectrum, you know, the governments are essentially autocratic. So they have entire control over the so sovereign wealth fund. For example, the Qatari sovereign wealth fund, by their own estimation, only five or six people in the whole of Qatar know where all those billions are allocated and what the structure of it looks like. So with this Angolan sovereign wealth fund, the five billion that is in it is meant to protect the interests of Angola for those three categories, which is stability, profit ma maximization, and economic development. So what would make sense is if the Angolan Sovereign Wealth Fund were to contribute money into DRC, but for a tangible benefit back to Angola. What is unclear perhaps, and that what we should raise a question is, why would there be a conversation about extending a, what is essentially a private loan to a member of a foreign government for that individual or group of individuals private commercial interest. It has no bearing well, on- Lakshmi, I was um, um, about to interrupt you because you're, I, I oh, have to- sorry, so, but, but, but I think <laughs> that's-, that's, that's your, that, your sentence. I think you know, th that sums up what I was I trying to say. I have a very tough job. No, <laughs> no, 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 I, I sort of- Strong beginning. Yes, I, I sort of uh, got lost in the intricacies of from a sovereign wealth funds. My, my apologies. Now no. I'd like to talk mm -hmm. about politics, please, okay. with okay. you. Politics, yeah. you want me to respond uh, to add or you just want to come Just a few. No, I just, I mean, you, uh, Lakshmi covered it pretty well. I think in the case that we're covering here, it's clear that weaker countries with weaker rule of law, almost in existence, weaker governance structure, have problems with the sovereign funds. You know, I happen to have lived in Norway. Things seem to work well. No, we, but Norway was a democracy when it covered, it discovered its oil and everything else. So the structure of governance were already there. Um, we see the, tr the struggle with Malaysia with the sovereign fund. Um, so again, I just want to add that to contextualize, just to add, I mean, she did a perfect job in it, so there's <laughs> Thank no you, thank you. Um, yeah, politics. Um, Kabila and Tishikedi. Uh, it seems there is um, a struggle between these two men about um, power in the DRC. Um, as you can see, um, a couple of days ago, a new prime minister was uh, named um, it is Sylvester Ilunga Ilunkamba. Uh, what do we know about his background and uh, how will his appointment shift the power dynamics in the DRC? And one, one question, one more question. Um, a few days ago, uh, President Felix Tshisekedi um, had a speech before the governors. Um, he announced 20 priorities and among them, there is one, the sixth priority, uh, that is titled Fight Against Corruption. Um, do you think it will be possible with this new prime minister? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I think two things. Yeah, power struggle. I was on the BBC a couple nights ago, and the journalist asked me, who's, who's the boss in DRC? And I told him, I don't know. And he came back, I said, what do you mean you don't know? And my response was, well, there is a president, and it's Felix Tshisekedi. It's obvious there is a president. But there is also the former president, who is the boss over a large political coalition, which controls the majority of both chambers of the parliament. Mm -hmm. And the Congolese system is not a presidential or parliamentary system. It's a mixed system. Mm -hmm. So which means the president does not have all the powers, especially when it comes to appointing the government. Mm. And the parliament doesn't have all the power either. But the balance of power is such as a big chunk of the power that the president needs, uh, will need uh, for, his, uh, for his program, rests with the parliament, both chambers. So there is the friction there. And this took this part of the reason that it took forever to get uh, to Ilunga. Mm. Behind Ilunga, there is also another dynamic, which is regional. 
So the, a, a lot of the caciques of the uh, PPRD and the FCC are from Katanga. So they've been demanding that the prime minister comes from Katanga. And that has not been sitting well with the rest of the Congolese. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, post should not be tied to region. So a lot of the names that have been proposed to the president to appoint as prime minister were rejected. One, either because some of them actually cited in this report, some of them under sanction, some of them just have bad reputation. And since President Chisekedi has made it clear that one of his missions, his priorities will be to fight corruption, which was also the mantra of his father, um, it becomes very problematic for him to accept any of these people. So eventually they settled on Ilunga, who happened to be Katangan. Mm -hmm. So he was the acceptable Katangan, uh, so to speak. Um, he's been in power, he's been in politics for 40 years. He's well educated, on, uh, holds a PhD in economics, has held a couple ministerial positions, and as of late was uh, uh, CEO and chairman of the board of the uh, SNCC, which is the railroad company. Uh, there, when you talk to people, some people say he did well, some people say he did terrible. Um, so the jury is still out on what will happen. But one key and important factor is, I, my hunch is that it took them this long to get to Ilunga because they were also struggling with the other ministerial posts. There are about seven, what they call regalian posts. Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, Budget. Who's going to sit on those positions were issues. So I believe that we're going to see a government pretty soon because now that Ilunga is there, it is his mission, they call them formateurs du gouvernement, to put up a team, to, to build a team that will be the next government. So it's a good thing for the country. It's a good thing for uh, President Chisekedi to have a government because people started wondering, mm -hmm. to go back to the question from the BBC journalist, who was the boss? Um, he's the president. Uh, we'll see how much of a boss he is. The time will tell. Thank you. Okay. A question for John now um, before coming back to you. Uh, Lakshmi, <laughs> last but not the least. Um, I, I'd like to talk about the, the recommendations you make in this report. Um, you aim at the Congolese government or financial international institutions in the United States and in Europe. Um, right now, um, the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of uh, International narcotics and uh, law enforcement affairs, either merit is talking about the necessity in the DRC to struggle against uh, corruption. By the way, do you feel uh, the same willingness um, from Europe, particularly from France and Belgium? That is a very good question. <laughs> uh, I don't know how well equipped I am to answer it. Um, uh, Two minutes, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, if we could cut that down to 30 seconds, I think I'll feel more comfortable. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think it's safe to say that the Belgian government has been fairly, uh, has, had, has put a, a foot forward with respect to corruption mm -hmm. in Congo, perhaps more so than France. And I'll caveat that by saying Pardon, pardon me for saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, free. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add the caveat that I am not myself a, a political expert, but, um, but that seems to be the, uh, that's what I've observed. Um, but also, I think one of the, the interesting aspects of this report is that, um, as you all noted, it comes at a particularly tense political time. So I, I don't know how we'll see um, European governments react to this. I assume mm -hmm. they will be interested, but whether or not that will turn into tangible action of some sort or uh, behind the scenes meetings and, and exhortations to uh, end corrupt practices, uh, I think that is yet to be seen. Um, there are many other countries uh, that are quoted in this report, uh, China for example, um, many outside actors involved um, in Kwanzaa Capital's illicit activity are uh, from countries such as China which have uh, fewer restrictions um, on corrupt activity. So is there anything that uh, the U.S. can do to counter illicit transactions between the DRC and those other states? Uh, again, another very good question. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I think one thing to note is that the, um, as anybody from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo in this room will know it's a heavy, heavily dollar-dependent economy. Um, I suppose to the extent that 
entities in Congo are conducting dollar-denominated transactions with Chinese uh, or Chinese-owned entities, um, there is an opportunity for U.S. regulators to intercede and um, potentially, and, and also correspondent banking partners to intercede and, and um, at least do additional investigations into certain types of financing that, that appears to, to be, um, have corrupt intent. Uh, in terms of the more technical aspects of, of that element, I think I would turn to my uh, distinguished colleague, Lakshmi, for uh, some commentary on that, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. No, that, that is not an issue. Um, I will keep it very short this time. Uh, but in terms of enforcement actions for a lot of this, historically, cross-border financial investigations, the U.S. has always taken the lead over Europe. A good example is right now what's going on in Mozambique with sort of the ma massive debt crisis that the country is incurring because of an individual minister's actions. Though the banks were situated in U the UK, the UK has actually dropped the investigation and what has continued is the US enforcement action against individuals concerned. The second thing that perhaps to consider is that the DRC is still not <clears throat> a member of GABAC, which is the FATF styled regional body for the region. So there hasn't been a mutual evaluation report done. So the first thing to sort of get start the process towards any kind of enforcement action is to do a mutual evaluation report to understand the laws in the country, understand where sort of the gaps and the loopholes lie. But I, I realize my two minutes are up, so I'm happy to yeah. talk about this. <laughs> Uh, outside yeah. of the event, but not more yeah. at the moment. You're welcome. <coughs> we, we, we can come back to you uh, after just a quick question to <coughs> Vemba about um, um, another actor. Uh, we talked about uh, China, European Union, the United States, and their sanctions, <coughs> or maybe their sanctions. Uh, what about DRC um, itself? I mean that uh, it is a, it is a, this country has its so sovereignty. <coughs> So it needs to, to combat um, itself uh, corruption. Um, and one of the key recommendations of your report is um, to apply more targeted sanctions to former President Kabila's network. Um, but we know that external sanctions are not, cannot substitute uh, for internal reform. Um, and sometimes have intended consequences. So how well can we expect sanctions to work in case um, like DRC? So a couple of things. The DRC, as I said earlier, has a strong culture of oversight. Mm. You know, most of the things we know about the DRC and corruption come from the Congolese. Yeah, I respect uh, John's work. I respect Global Witness, Enough, Century. But the big bulk of the research on corruption comes from the Congolese themselves, because this strong civil society does this. Congo was suspended from EITI, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, I think in 2013, because the Congolese did the work and exposed what was happening in DRC. Mm -hmm. In that case, it's worked because EITI was part of the process to help them su suspend DRC. I think we, as the international community, and Congo is part of that, uh, need to put more pressure, A, one, by supporting the groups that do this kind of investigative report inside the country to continue giving them the backing they need. Embassies, embassies, DFED, USAID, State Department, they have to give more money to these people so they can do the work that they're doing. They take tremendous risks, they don't have the means. Uh, we need to shield them from political pressure from the, the elite in the country who comes after them. And then two, to go back to what we said earlier at the outset, this is an international problem. In order for you to have a corruption, you have to have this to tango. You have to need to have two parties. Uh, we cannot always focus on the networks within Congo because the networks within Congo are tied to the international network. And they use, of course, the international <laughs> banking system. Uh, so that's when, so far, look at groups like Glencore. What has Glencore suffered so far? Nothing. In fact, they're so comfortable that they even recently gave a gift to Congo, they claim. $1.4 billion write-off to Congo. So the arrogance of it all uh, need to end. And I think that's where we can help. Because the Congolese are actually pretty advanced in doing the work inside. But they need the support from outside to help. 
Okay, thank you, um, Bemba. Um, just uh, two more questions before uh, giving the floor to, to the audience. Um, maybe we can come back to Lakshmi if you can uh, finish your previous answer. Um, and after that, I will ask you something about uh, the IMF program. I actually, um, I actually just want to finish up on, on the, 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 to sort of conclude what I wanted to say was also to touch on sanctions, which is that sanctions when, are, when they are put in place, in this case, you know, we have BJIF Bank, which is not just a bank in Congo, it, it is the largest in terms of financial assets in the whole of Central Africa. And so if you're sort of putting sanctions on one bank, there's also sort of a reputational risk that has a cascading effect for the region. And so you're not, you're not just thinking about this in terms of, of Congo, you're thinking about this in terms of the whole region. Now another sort of, sort of tied in issue into all of this is that when you're thinking about domestic enforcement versus international enforcement, now domestic enforcement is easier if the institutions, like the regulatory bodies or the oversight bodies, are separate from the individuals in power. If there is a close nexus, like you see, you saw with Fujimori in Peru, es <coughs> Estrada in Philippines, then it becomes impossible for domestic institutions to report because they are slow, so the, the nexus between the two is so close. And therefore, you have to have international or sort of the intermediaries in place, whether it's lawyers or company service providers. And, 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 and in all of this, there is the balance of having to make sure that the sanctions or the international enforcement doesn't collapse the economy, doesn't prevent future growth of business, doesn't have effects that extend not just to DRC, but also more importantly, to all the regions around it which share banking relationships and use similar banking institutions. And that's something that I think is very important that we emphasize when we're talking about recommendations. Um, still um, in this part about recommendations, um, I have a, a, a last question for you, um, Lakshmi. It's about the IMF program. Mm -hmm. uh, on page 29 of the report, uh, John, uh, your team write the US Department of State and the US Treasury Department should strongly encourage the Congolese government to ask the IMF to restart a program in Congo, uh, specifically an extended credit facility. Um, yeah, the IMF has long refrained from providing any assistance pack package to the DRC until a credible path toward political stability is clearly reached. Okay, uh, Lakshmi, in your opinion, and uh, in the wake of the transition, the current transition in the DRC, is it time for the IMF uh, and other international um, financial institution, institutions to take another look at assistance to the DRC? What do you think? I think, you know, there is, if there is sort of, if you can provide more resources, it is, it is always a positive situation. But as John correctly mentioned, a lot of this requires political will. There has to be sort of the involvement from the government to want to do it. And in order for that to happen, there have to be sort of effective China walls of separation between people that can control those transparency and corruption mechanisms to, separ to separate it. And if you can't do that, then there has to be an alternative solution where you can say that, you're, that the country is often willing to have sort of an external body evaluate the, this credit facility mechanism. Now, if you can't do those, and, and in, in, in many cases, a sovereign government doesn't want to necessarily do that. But if there are con concerns of corruption and political will, then the only other solution is to have sort of a greater external presence when you're talking about the restarting of uh, the IMF credit facility program. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for your um, complete, relevant, um, short, sometimes long answers. <laughs> Um, sure, our audience appreciates the high level of uh, expertise you have. Now we are moving to the discussion with you uh, for 20, 30, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I would like to open the floor to you. I insist on um, the word question, uh, neither disguised question nor uh, monologuing. No, question, please. Um, and before saying your question, I ask you two things. Um, after that, I'll be nice. Just two things before, to identify yourself, who you are, 
where do you speak from? And formulate a short question so as to permit a maximum of us to speak. So, and short answers, uh, if, you, if I may. So, um, who would like to ask a question? Um, sir, here. Hi, I'm Tom Sindrick. I'm with uh, C Squared Concepts. I noticed you mentioned Dan Gertler, and I also saw in the report you mentioned Benny Steinmetz. Benny Steinmetz recently uh, ended his issues with Guinea by what we know to make payoffs. Is the DRC continuing to go after Benny Steinmetz for FCPA violations, um, or working with the U.S. to go after him for FCPA violations, or potentially sanctions? Um, from OFAC. John? I mentioned Dan Gettler, oh, but you can answer the question. Yeah, uh, you, but one person to, uh, to answer, please, if, yeah. if you want to speak. Um, okay. I, you can uh, I give you a short and unfortunately not particularly satisfying answer, which is I, I really don't know. Um, but I'm sure there are some folks here from uh, various agencies and entities who might be able to uh, shed some light on that fact for you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, here. The woman here, please. Thanks. Oui, uh, c'est Madame Elodine Tamuzinda. Je représente uh, les organisations féminines de la RDC au sein de la Commission électorale nationale indépendante. Je voulais féliciter uh, l'action que vous êtes en train de mener. Je sais que c'est pour améliorer la vie euh, de la communauté congolaise et lorsque vous parlez d'autres pays, c'est pareil. Mais je voulais aussi savoir est-ce qu'il y a déjà eu l'évaluation des impacts sur certains acteurs ou certains pays africains depuis peut-être 30 ans, si nous pouvons prendre la période de 30 ans, 20 ans, 10 ans, 5 ans, l'impact sur la population S'il n'y a pas d'impact, est-ce qu'il y a moyen d'y réfléchir autrement et de voir réellement ce que cela peut apporter à la population Cela peut nous aider aussi à étudier les mécanismes de voir si réellement nous sommes en train de bien agir ou bien si nous pouvons rectifier ce que nous faisons. Merci beaucoup. Um, juste une question. Um, évaluation de quoi Des sanctions? Okay. Uh, it is a question for John, I think. Uh, she is asking, um, thank you for your question. Uh, she says she represents women uh, from DRC here. And um, she, she, uh, congr she congratulates uh, John and uh, the, um, the NGOs who work on improving uh, conditions of living of Congolese people. Um, and she's asking if the sanctions have been evaluated last 30, 10, 5 years um, to see if it works or if it does not work. So maybe John could answer this question. Sure, and I will uh, respond in English if that's okay. okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your question. I, I very much appreciate it and the work you do. Um, I will say that uh, I don't have a satisfying answer for you. If I understand your question to be, what is the effect of sanctions on everyday people who are living in systems where uh, there's exploitative governance and where um, kleptocratic officials do not operate in the best interest of the people, but rather in the, their own best interest. Um, I do not have a very good answer for that. And I also, unfortunately, don't really have a good answer for you with respect to how effective sanctions are when deployed against uh, particular people who violate human rights, engage in acts of corruption, et cetera. What I can tell you is that um, we at the Century are, are engaged in some studies along those lines. Uh, and I know there are some other academic institutions who have looked at just those questions. Um, and, and I'd be happy to discuss with you afterwards and perhaps send you some materials by email, uh, if possible, that would uh, potentially get to answering your question. Thank you. Okay, uh, the question is interesting because we remember that a few months ago um, the U.S. government um, launched sanctions against uh, some people from the 
the, um, the commission who organized the elections in, uh, in, in the DRC, so it is interesting to know uh, how effective these sanctions are and uh, what consequences they have on, on, on people that were targeted. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, yeah? Sorry. Just to follow up, it depends on the sanctions. I mean, sanctions uh, depend on what you're trying to accomplish. If you are sanctioning people on the electoral commission because there were malversation, embezzlement, whatever they were, that obviously sends a message to the next people. If you're sanctioning somebody like Dan Gettler because they were malpractice and things, well, hopefully that serves as a notice to potential future investors. Uh, now, there are the sanctions. If you, we typically in this country, at least in the US, in Washington, the people that I know do not advocate for sanction against humanitarian aid, for instance. Uh, nobody's saying do not give Congo money to the government because of public health. That doesn't work that way. So it depends, I think, on what sanction and when. But your question is very well taken. I think it, it's worth looking into those things. Another question? Um, hi, uh, my name is Bob Kingombe. I'm here for Stand with Congo. My question is uh, addressed to John. Uh, at first, I'd like to say thank you for your report. But uh, sorry to tell you that it's not really new for us. Everything that's um, can you a speak louder, please? We can. I was saying thank you firstly for the reports, and uh, secondly is to tell you that it's not really new for us. Everything that you put on the reports, and there is a lot of stuff that we would like to see on the reports, but we didn't see ex um, let's say especially on um, the mining aspects, right? And the second question it's pretty much to know. What is the next step? Uh, sorry, could you repeat your, your affiliation? I'm not sure I got it. OK. The question. No, 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 no. no, no. Your, your Where do you come from? Ah, stand with Congo. I'm Congolese. Ah, OK. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Yes, there are, of course, many things we would have loved to have discussed in this report. But um, as you'll see, it's, it's already at, at 48 pages running pretty long, which makes it um, prohibitively dense for most uh, readers. Um, so we would have liked to have talked about more. Um, I think the mining industry, as you point out, is uh, there's plenty of corruption in that sector as well. Um, the, the specific scope of this report was to look at acts of corruption and manipulation of the financial system within the country and external actors who were uh, participants in that process. But um, I can tell you in terms of next steps that we, the Century, are an organization that will continue to exist after this event. And uh, our mission is to, as I said at the outset, to uh, follow the money and uh, expose acts of corruption related to kleptocrats and the international networks that enable them. So uh, rest assured that we will continue doing what we do. Um, would you like to add something, sir? I think that no? was a thumbs up. OK. So. <laughs> OK. It's up to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Duncan Jepson from Liberty Shared. I just wanted to talk about the uh, Taiho Group, the subsidiary in Hong Kong, and then payments to the registered bank in uh, Congo. Um, I can't find, just looking on my phone, that the subsidiary is registered on the Monetary Authority of Singapore as a shareholder of a bank in a foreign jurisdiction. I'm not sure off the top of my head that's a requirement. But what I'm interested in is how was the bank in Congo capitalized? What, was, what money was sent to that bank, uh, CTBC, in order to create it as a banking registered entity in Congo? And then were payments made to the Kwanzaa Group in order for some sort of facilitation of the discussions about, was it called BIAC? So I've only just read the report. No, no, no. So <laughs> did you see any of those transfers taking through? If so, were, was the bank capitalized in the Congo with the US dollar? And you talked about the classic uh, correspondent banking, because if it was, then obviously a shareholding increase must go up in the equity of the subsidiary back in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I sort of know what information you had about that range of transactions. Uh, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll start out with the share capital of the bank. I believe it, it was somewhere around $12 million. Um, I, I'll just maybe correct the record a little bit and say that the way we characterize it in the report is that um, the, the range of activities we've uncovered raises questions as to whether Kwanzaa Capital uh, or, or these two individuals who uh, were controlling Kwanzaa Capital or who we identify as controlling Kwanzaa Capital under the auspices of Kwanzaa Capital influenced the fate of this bank, which was, as we know, uh, systemically important to the sector at that time. Um, but 
had a, a run on its on, on uh, there was a run on the bank and then it was taken under control by the central bank. There were a series of um, strange decisions that were made and then ultimately this uh, you know kind of out of the ether candidate gets selected. Um, we don't have too much visibility into China Taihei Bank of Congo really beyond what's presented in the report. Um, that's something that uh, we of course would have liked to have provided more granular detail about um, just the kind of financing and shareholding you discussed. Um, we don't deal with China and that's obviously a, a, a completely different uh, environment with respect to uh, obtaining information. So, um, so I don't have a, a particularly satisfying answer in that regard, which seems to be a, a trend for my answers today. Um, but I'd be happy to, to maybe have a, a discussion with you offline and, and uh, maybe exchange on that uh, particular anecdote. So? Yeah, thank you, thank you. My name is Jay Babu. I'm with the Kengo Diaspora Network. And my question will go to John. So you um, went through this whole expose and talking about the, the whole situation that we've seen with the uh, BGFI in the Congo and other stuff. So this whole situation is an iceberg so far because right now to me, you know, as one of the Congolese youth and representing many, right? So you're tackling the problem that's pretty much just been seen because mm -hmm. the whole situation is a whole iceberg. Down there, it's farther out, and it took root for a long time. So you pretty much started with investigating Kabila, with all the people that were pretty much there working with him, and then to have pretty much the whole chaos that we have in our country. But what type of effort uh, would you be able to hold Felix Chisekedi's hand into this whole process to tackle the problem way down there? What is taking root? What would you say about that? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I'd like to point to a response that Mvamba gave, which is the, the, on the robustness and importance of oversight from the Congolese civil society, which is uh, deeply rooted in the culture there, as you mentioned, the, the culture of oversight. Um, I think it, it shouldn't be on obviously me personally or the Century as a foreign non-Congolese organization to really hold Mr. Chisichetti's hand as you put it, but uh, rather that we can help support Congolese civil society in doing just that and uh, making sure that, that Mr. Chisichetti is accountable to the fact that civil society should be protected and not uh, menaced or, or pushed into the shadows. If anybody else would like to respond on that point. Yeah, I just want to add To work to, to help President Chisekedi, we need to have robust structures and processes. He believes in them, from what he says. He cannot deliver on them because his hands are tied, just because the structure, which I described earlier, the, the, a big chunk of the power structure that he doesn't control. And those power structures are controlled by some networks that are not particularly clean. But civil society has been fighting this fight for a long time. They need the support. They need to be. They need to be. They don't need to be put to the side in the name of this, in the name of that. They should be supported fully, and this is the time to support them. And that's the way to support President Chisekedi. Uh, speeches alone will not do. Uh, um, ju just to add something about what you said, and what people say there is something like um, a desire of justice. You say, um, no justice, no peace. Um, you have uh, technical recommendations about the um, financial system, that's fine. Um, but what about uh, fight against impunity? What I mean is, um, now, we, 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 for example, we saw that the, the International Penal um, Court uh, lost its credibility these last years or months or weeks. Uh, so what else? Sorry, if I can say so, what else? Uh, if you don't have an international court um, to fight against impunity, <coughs> so what, what could we do? That is a, a, a question of justice that is uh, asked by the civil society. Uh, what could we do? Uh, I should say, what could the new president could do? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you obtain justice in such a system? 
That is a very good question again. Um, I, I think I would maybe give some brief remarks on that and then turn it to um, Lakshmi and Mvemba if they would like to uh, reinforce my answer uh, or go a different direction, as it were. Um, so the recommendations we're providing in the report are, um, as I noted, there are three buckets. There's really the um, regu external regulatory agencies and law enforcement authorities can take action that chip away at that impunity that you just discussed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one step. Second step would be that financial institutions, uh, and Lakshmi noted this is a global system, and these people who are corrupt actors in Congo as in anywhere else in the world, uh, North America, Europe, et cetera, they need to move money through that global financial system. So we're also recommending that, again, with specific reference to this report, that financial institutions that may have been exposed to the activities described in these pages uh, look back and say, you know, are we touched by these uh, transactions involving these individuals and entities, uh, or did we process transactions for them? And to, to, to do what they can uh, to make sure that either those transactions are stopped or they're properly evaluated by the, the relevant national regulator or financial intelligence unit. Uh, and then finally, the recommendations we're offering um, are for the Congolese government. Um, there is, of course, the, the broader question of political will there, but I think the, the constructive recommendations we've offered, um, if, if implemented, uh, would, would hopefully chip away at some of the impunity we see that, that really undergirds the, the kind of um, radical activities that you see in this sort of a, a unhinged uh, level of corruption you see in this report. Mm -hmm. You know, because you mentioned the International Criminal Court, very often when we when we put this in the brackets of you know, criminal court human rights violations, they are very polarizing issues. They inflame local populations, they inflame citizens of that country. But when you start talking about it in terms of trade and business, very often there's a sort of greater success. A good example is what happened with uh, in Kenya when <coughs> members of the government were sent to ICC. There was a huge backlash. You know, the case fell apart. Conversely, when the last time the Sentry published a report on South Sudan, which tied financial transactions to both Uganda and Kenya, there was actual change in laws to target real estate transactions. So the financial system is often sort of an indirect, more diplomatic way of handling the same thing because countries want to be players in international business and international trade. There is no escaping that unless as a country you completely decide, I will withdraw myself, there is sort of survival instinct that says you want to engage with government, you want to grow. And this is sort of a backhanded way of, of, of dealing with those things, but dealing it in a more progressive way rather than, than I think then sometimes can be a more polarizing thing when you take a case to the ICC. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other question here? Thank you, I'm Leila Njai with the Initiative for Global Development. My question is politics and our DRC. Uh, now the uh, president, uh, the dad was uh, an opponent to President Mobutu, we all know that. And uh, he's dealing with uh, Kabila's son and now with a prime minister who served under President Mobutu for a long time. Is Mobutu back in DRC and uh, in terms of ideology? And also, uh, he has the hard task to form a government. Are we going to expect a gouvernement d'ouverture? Thank you. I'm sorry, the what was the last part? We're going to ah. <laughs> uh, Mobutu is back. Um, I don't know if he ever left. But <laughs> <laughs> people nev never live in, in the DRC. I'm not sure he left, <laughs> you know, but uh, he's dead, but I don't think he left. <laughs> you know, we always say you can check out, but you never leave. He did check out, but I think he's still there. Uh, he's 32 years of power, obviously, <coughs> a lot of his influence will be present. Um, will uh, the, pr the Prime Minister Ilunkumba represent the old school with Mobutu? I don't know. I mean, that remains to be seen. I doubt it because he's answering to the people who nominated him, which are the FCC people. A lot of people in that groupment are from the Mobutu years, but they certainly don't, do not behave like they behaved during the Mobutu years. In fact, you don't, the level of corruption is one that we've not seen even during the Mobutu years. In other words, during the Mobutu years, schools were funded. 
I'm not talking about 92 to 97. I'm talking about the years when I was growing up. Yeah, we went to school. The military was funded. Public health was funded. It was not Norway. It was Zaire that was funded. Um, the last 17 years, nothing has been funded at any level that is respectable for a country. This is where the coalition between the FCC and the Chisekedi camp will have to show what it's worth. And we don't know what it's going to be worth. That's a question of who's boss and what ideology. So we're still waiting to see who's the boss. John, I'm Steve Weissman. I wanted to ask you, with your expertise, um, you, you kept using the word recently just chip away, which suggests it's not going to be a, a complete solution. Um, with your expertise, how easy is it for, if you go after a company like Kwanzaa Capital, for the same people behind you to set up another company? How easy is it if you go after their dollars to find other means, other currencies, or other means of doing this. Uh, do the anti-money laundering sanctions that you're advocating, um, can they be really effective given your knowledge of how the financial system works if you're, say, aiming at the Kabila clan? Now, of course, all of this is theoretical since, as Mbemba is pointing out, it's almost impossible to believe anyone would go after Mr. Kabila given the political power he's amassed in the system that still ex that exists even under President Chisichetti. But I'd be interested in your financial expertise on this. Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, I think we would be remiss to put a report out such as this and then pack up, go home, and, and you know, rest on our laurels, so to speak. Um, this kind of work requires maintenance. You have to really stick at it if you're serious about it and you want it to, to have a positive impact in the world, um, investigating, advocating, um, writing policy papers on down the line. Um, but with respect to the impact this specific report would have on Kwanzaa Capital and the people in its orbit, um, I think what we've done here is we've named individuals who now are on the radar of uh, any of the compliance people who are in this room or perhaps listening in. Um, those people are now known. Uh, we've raised the cost of business for not only the people in this report, but also other people who are affiliated with them. It will now be, in theory, harder for them to do these kinds of activities the way they have done them. So uh, it will require a change in tactics, techniques, and procedures. They may need uh, different service providers to help facilitate their activities, et cetera. So again, nobody's expecting permanence here. What we're expecting is that we're exposing something we're creating uh, awareness of these kinds of behaviors and the entities and individual, in, individuals involved with them. Um, and uh, when they change up their, their uh, ways of operating, hopefully we'll be right there to, to expose those as well. Um, it is the last question. Please. Well, lucky me. <laughs> Dan is my name. Africa Kilowatt is the game. We're directly and indirectly involved with investments in the Congo. My question is a reverse. Obviously, it's not easy to attract money into the Congo for all the reasons stated. Do you have a handbook? Do you have a guidance? Either, any of you. How does one convince other U.S. companies to invest in the Congo? I think this goes back to taking a risk-based approach to anywhere you go, which is, you know, don't just look at a list or like a third-party database and make an assumption. It is a combination of understanding the geography, which if it then poses a risk, okay, that's a risk factor. The next thing to look at is, you know, when you onboard a client, what is that client? What are their antecedents? What is the nature of that investment corporation? Because there are outliers in all of these examples, and to sort of close off investment into a country means it means exacerbating the problem. It means collapse of that economy. It also means moving money into less transparent channels, which then just becomes a vicious cycle. So I think you know there are multiple stages in sort of the risk assessment process that start from geography, client, investment, 
structure of the organization, where they have affiliates organized. That you know that that it is. It seems like a checklist, but it is truly sort of the only way to sort of act as a bulwark against the tide, which just says pull out all investment, which is I think a dangerous trend that since 2015 we've seen all over the world. And the Caribbean, especially the Caribbean region, is suffering a lot as a consequence because of attitudes like that. Let us add that one thing quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think mm -hmm. I presume you're an American outfit. Uh, if you are, I think it's also time now we start pushing the U.S. government to start underwriting the risk for American businesses. I used to wear that hat. I used to try to do business in Congo, and it was terrible. I can tell you. I remember one time going for two weeks and staying for four months and still not accomplishing anything of what I wanted to do. Um, so that's where we are today. They are putting in the DRC. We need to go invest there, with all this notwithstanding. But it's normal that a businessman like yourself will be reticent. The Chinese are not reticent because they, their engagements are already under, the risk is underwritten by Exim Bank of China and others. So the US has to find a way. We cannot wait for the Africans, for the Congolese, to come with this perfect solution. It just will not gonna happen in the next 20 years. We need to get in the game so that that will change. Our presence alone will change a lot of things. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry to close this discussion. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, but we have to, to close at, at five. Um, John, you are congr congratulated by many people here for your report, but you are under pressure as you can see, because um, people, um, through their questions, they expect a lot uh, from you. Um, they accept a lot from uh, Congolese NGOs also, because uh, I think that uh, people from Congo are um, doing the same as you do, um, in very tough uh, conditions, as you said. And um, it's important for, for us everyone to protect the lanceur d'alerte, uh, to help you, to help the investigators to, to, go, um, to go through this, um, this mess, because uh, um, it is the, the year one. People are asking uh, a lot um, to break a tragic history these last years. And uh, I think it's important to do that, not, not in our name, uh, but uh, in the Congolese uh, people name and beyond that the in the um, humanity's name so uh, good luck for the following steps uh, because you have a tough job to 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 do and uh, and we'll be here to follow what you're doing thank you thank you, thank you.